Here in the heart of Mississippi's Whispering Pines lies an extraordinary institution, born from the vision of an extraordinary man, Dr. Lawrence C. Jones. In 1909, after becoming the only African-American graduate from the University of Iowa the previous year, Jones embarked on a mission fueled by determination and a dream to educate disenfranchised African-Americans. His journey led him to the Piney Woods area, where amidst nothing but pine trees, an old log cabin, and a clear spring, he founded what would become a beacon of hope and enlightenment. One day, under a cedar tree, a boy with a book turned upside down revealed the dire need for education. This moment sparked the beginning of Piney Woods School. As word of Jones's teachings spread, the community came together to support his vision, the generous donation of a cabin and 40 acres by the sole African-American landowner in the area, coupled with materials from a white lumber mill owner, enabled the construction of the school. It was a collective effort with the entire community, regardless of race, contributing to the cause. As we trace the school's evolution, witnessing its growth from humble beginnings to a sanctuary of innovation and tradition, we are reminded of the enduring spirit of its community. The Piney Woods narrative is a mosaic of lives intertwined with the legacy of those who walked its paths before, each story a testament to ambition, resilience, and the pursuit of dreams without limit. Thank you, Bob Warren. Now, let's begin a story of a great man, a modern Booker T. Washington. Your story, sir. This is your life, Dr. Lawrence C. Jones, the little professor of Piney Woods, Mississippi. It's an autumn day in the year 1909. You're 25 years old. You're sitting on a pine log under a lone cedar tree in a woodland clearing about 20 miles south of Jackson, Mississippi. Is that right? What was your sum total of cash and worldly possessions on that day in 1909, Dr. Jones? Oh, about a dollar and 65 cents. Yes, and the clothes that you oh, had, had on. on. But your mind is at grips with a more appalling darkness, the midnight of ignorance laid upon the minds of little children. Your heart aches for them because at this time there are no schools whatsoever for Negro children of this region. Is that right? That's right. And. Sorely troubled, you remember the voices of your mother and your Aunt Liza as they sang an old spiritual, Keep a Inch in the Long. Keep a inch in the long, keep a inch in the long. Ooh. Inch in the long begins for you from the time you're born, Lawrence Jones. That was uh, Missouri, wasn't it? In Missouri, St. Joe, Missouri. Yes, sir. What'd your father John do there? He was a porter in the old Pacific Hotel. You loved him so much that for a long time as a boy, you thought he owned that hotel, didn't you? <laughs> yeah, that was his hotel. <laughs> you inch your way through grammar school, shining shoes and delivering newspapers. And it's work and more of it to put yourself through high school in Marshalltown, Iowa. By the time school started in the morning, Lawrence Jones had already done a half day's work. Graduating from college in 1907, your strong sense of duty has inched your way along to the pine log under the cedar tree in Mississippi. Is it a voice or just the wind whispering in the pines that reminds you of a saying about the great educator Mark Hopkins? What was that saying, Dr. Jones? Not uh, only is Mark Hopkins, uh, Mark Hopkins on one end of the log and a student on the other end is the same as a university. It would constitute a university. And this is your mission to teach. You decide to open school right there under the sky. And the first morning you have one pupil and the next there are three of them. In two weeks there are 29. I was one of those children. Most of the others could not read or write. And Professor Jones taught us without asking for a penny. Now you may or may not remember that voice, Dr. Jones. Here's a boy from the year 1909, now minister of the Second Baptist Church of Fresno, California, the Reverend William C. Dixon. Here he is. <laughs> what was it like those first weeks in the Piney Woods, Reverend Dixon? Well, when 
the weather was chilly, we would build a large bonfire. We'd roll our logs together around it and hear the classes. And then we would hew out the benches at recess time. And Professor Jones taught us without asking for a penny. Yes, sir. It must have really been quite an experience, boys and girls of 15, say, coming to start school like that. Yes, uh, because they were unable to read or write. And of course, in return, some of you pupils used to bring your teacher a sack of vegetables now and then, didn't you? Oh, yes, we did when we were able to do so. <laughs> and uh, it was a saying among the people that Professor Jones ate dried peas for breakfast, drank water for lunch, and he swelled up and burst for dinner. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend William C. Dixon. Thank you. Nobody knows the trouble I've seen. The next need is shelter. Winter is ahead. Near the cedar tree is a ruined log cabin used for years as a shed for sheep. The cabin and the 40 acres of land around it belong to an ex-slave, old Uncle Ed Taylor. Uncle Ed Taylor learned how well the children were getting along, so he gave that old log cabin and the land to the school. Now, that's the voice of your very first volunteer helper, Dr. Jones. Tell us who it is. A carpenter who had heard you teach, and he came to you as a young man without any hope of pay. William F. Jackson. Now a prospering Rouge, building <laughs> contractor in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. Here's your dear friend, William Yancey. Mr. Yancey. <laughs> you say those loud. I don't want to miss anything. <laughs> I want to know, was I turning pale? <laughs> oh. <laughs> Mr. Yancey, you and Lawrence Jones put a floor and a chimney in that cabin and divided it into two rooms, didn't you? Yes, we did. We fixed the little room so that we could live in it, and the large room was our first schoolhouse. Then the boys helped us to cut down trees so that we could plant a crop so that we could eat. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Yancey. Thank you, sir. Your joy over the little cabin soon turns to anxiety. More and more children come, and many must sit outside, shivering with cold, waiting their turn for classes. Now, how you met this crisis, we'll find out in a moment. Back to This Is Your Life, Dr. Lawrence C. Jones, the little professor of Piney Woods, Mississippi. <laughs> months of 1909-1910, 40 children are overflowing your tiny cabin school. You summon up courage to appeal to members of the rural community. At large mass meetings you do this. Now here are two of the earliest friends you made in the Piney Woods. Today they are proud to be on the board of trustees of your school. From Jackson, Mississippi, Mr. and Mrs. W.F. Mahaffey. And here they are. What did Professor Jones say at that mass meeting, Ms. Mahaffey? Oh, his words were quite simple, but most touching. You remember you told us that the children did not have clothes warm enough to sit out in the cold and wait their turn for classes. Many of you give donations that day, but the big thrill is when the mill owner, John Webster, speaks up. And what did he say, Mr. Mahaffey? He said Lawrence Jones had the most gumption and determination of any man he ever saw. He says, Lawrence, I'm going to give you 10,000 feet of lumber to build that first schoolhouse right here in our community. And as you need credit, I'll see that it's extended to you. Well, thank you, Mr. and Ms. Mahaffey, for telling us about that great day. Want to hold out to the end. You, the students, and their 
their parents put up that first building yourselves. It's just completed when one of those gulf storms blows in. And what happened to the building, Dr. Joe? Blew it, blew it down. <laughs> yes, sir. But you repair it and keep an inch and along. And you never turn any students away from your doors. Some of us came with a sack of sweet potatoes, some with a couple of geese. Some of us empty-handed, but the little professor gave book learning free to all. The voice of a girl from your second graduating class who went on to build three rural schools by her own efforts. Now she's back teaching on your own campus. Here from Piney Woods to surprise you is Miss Georgie L. Myers. <laughs> Miss Myers. <laughs> well, you saw the school grow, Miss Myers. Tell us why the students love it so. We built that school with our own hand, Mr. Edwards, and that is why we love every board and every brick put into it. Yes, I know. From the first small donations, $20 is used to buy a donkey broken to a plow. You remember that Jenny donkey, Miss Myers? Yes, you remember? I do. I <laughs> sure do. <laughs> that donkey helped us to make boarding students come to the Pinewood School. Otherwise, we wouldn't have had anything to eat. That's right. <laughs> well, and uh, of course, the boys uh, built framed the dormitories, didn't they? Framed dormitories and, and uh, some of them got boring later on. And so new buildings had to be put up. Well, thank you, Georgie L. Myers. Thank you. After Dr. Lawrence C. Jones, the little professor, captivated the nation with the tale of Piney Woods on that 1954 episode of This Is Your Life, the host called the nation to action, inviting viewers to send in just one dollar to support the school. And America responds, blessing the school with over $700,000, a testament to the collective power of the people. Over the years, this beacon of hope and education has continued to draw the attention and generosity of many, becoming a beloved cause for celebrities, dignitaries, and kind-hearted souls alike. Helen Keller, with her indomitable spirit, saw the value of Piney Woods in fostering independence and learning. Charles Schultz, creator of beloved Peanuts characters, shared his warmth and humor in support of the school's mission. James Earl Jones, Morgan Freeman, and Denzel Washington lent their iconic voices to amplify the school's story, inspiring others to contribute. Katie Couric, George H.W. Bush, and Della Reese showcased their commitment to education and youth, underscoring the importance of the work being done at the school. The support didn't stop at American shores. Zambian Ambassador Dr. Inonge Mbikusita Lewanika, an advocate for education globally, recognized the school's impact. Musical talents like Wynton Marsalis and opera singer Denise Graves brought their unique gifts to bear, highlighting the arts as a vital component of education. Statesmen and women, including John Lewis, Carolyn Cheeks Kilpatrick, Andrew Young, and even Coretta Scott King saw in the school a living embodiment of the struggle for equality and the pursuit of excellence. Figures from the legal and broadcasting world, like Judge Maybelline Ephraim, Kathy Hughes, and the incomparable Oprah Winfrey, have also stood in solidarity with Piney Woods, offering their support to ensure the continuation of its mission. With every gift, every shout out, these champions weave their essence into Piney Woods fabric, fueling a legacy of resilience and dreams. It's a collective effort that keeps on giving, pushing generation after generation towards greatness. What about living and learning in a place like this? The Piney Woods Country Life School an all-black boarding school in rural Mississippi. Most of the kids who come here are from poor, single-parent homes. Many come from the toughest we neighborhoods in the country. Russell, from Detroit, is 18. He's been here three years. Uh, since the years I've been here, I lost four friends at home. And just recently, last you Friday... You lost four friends? Four friends. How? Um, violence, street violence. I lost... Um, my first year, I lost two at the same time. It, shot? Shot. Just recently, on uh, last Friday, I lost my cousin. He was stabbed to death. Kiyama is from New York, from Brooklyn. Around my neighborhood, it's gunshots, and that's all you hear is like, 
I'm totally aware. As soon as I get off that plane, I know. Yeah, this is New York. I'm home. <laughs> Ooh, it's rough, but here is quiet, nice, settled. You know, you don't have to think about, oh, gee, I'm going to school today. I hope I don't get shot. Anything like that. Here, you know, that your, your focus is education. Piney Woods is about as no-nonsense as education gets in this country. The school was started at the turn of the century by a black educator to provide basic education for the children of field hands. For the last seven years, the school president has been Dr. Charles Beatty, who's taken the basics, upgraded them, and toughened them. The ethic is the work ethic, the discipline boot camp. Drugs, absent. Guns, absent. Kids, 300 boarders, grades 7 through 12, present and accounted for. Kids who the sociologists describe as at risk, meaning likely to drop out, get pregnant. All the familiar goodies of American urban life. What percentage of your kids who come here uh, fit that profile or that possibility? 100%. Every youngster that I have seen in the time that I've been at Piney Woods was at risk of becoming a problem for me, you, and society. To get into Piney Woods, a student must have a C average. Tuition is about $3,500 a year, but almost 90% are on some kind of scholarship. No one is turned away because of money. The school raises it from charitable foundations, from corporations like DuPont and Maytag and from individuals. Charles Schultz, creator of Peanuts, financed the Snoopy Hall dorm. The kids get here because they, or their parents, or someone in the neighborhood wanted to save them. Dr. Beatty says every one of them faced hopelessness at home, or at school, or at both. The programs that we put together are intended to say to the young person that you can be successful, you're just as bright as anybody else, that your primary purpose for being here is to get yourself a good education, and our primary purpose for being here is to make sure that happens. And the best overall average in trigonometry... And it does happen. Standards are high. Grades are monitored weekly. Horseplay is not tolerated. Excellence is demanded and assumed. The place is the opposite of the warehouses so many public schools have become. More than 90% of Piney Woods graduates go on to college, to small state schools, to the Ivy League. Russell's a senior. He's been accepted at four colleges. Eric, also a senior, has been accepted at half a dozen. Talicia's going to the University of California. Everybody at Piney Woods must work at least 10 hours a week in a variety of jobs on the campus. Our young people are not uh, used to work. We have a work program, not so much to train farmers, though there's nothing wrong with that, or dry cleaner operators, though there's nothing wrong with that, but to instill the work ethic. Like to thank you for the teachers, Lord. Like to and you're going to pray if you're going to stay here, pray three times a day on Sunday. Let's get your garbage. <laughs> the discipline is all about enabling these kids to take control of their lives. There are rules for everything. There's a dress code, a makeup code, a hair code. No sneakers in class, no colored nail polish. All orders and requests from adults must be obeyed. We have a book of rules. How to become a Piney Woods student and how to become an ex Piney Woods student. Pregnancy and impregnation is one of them. Uh, if, if a kid fights, that kid has to leave. But. You threw a girl out, a girl who became pregnant, just four weeks before graduation. I didn't throw anybody out. Well, she If she was... had abided by the rules and regulations, she'd still be a Piney Woods student. That seems tough. I mean, why not let her graduate and at least get the benefit of having been here? My philosophy has always been the greatest good for the greatest number, and I agonize uh, often over the fact that some of our young people have to, uh, have to leave. I've shed tears over it, but I can't afford to let one person stopped the forward progress of, uh, of, of the Piney Woods Country Life School and, and what we're all about. I, I have, have, have in-house blues. In-house blues. Dr. Beatty. Dr. 
to be. Please, can't you see? Please, can't you see? That this in house is changing me. That this in house is changing me. For lesser offenses, there's something called in house detentions that last from dinner to bedtime and all day Saturday. The first rule of in house is utter silence. They were allowed to break it for a few minutes, for our sake. I'm in for insubordination, for not being quiet when I was told to. What are you in for? Um, this is a misunderstanding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in for cutting class. I cut my geometry teacher's class. You knew where you'd end up. I knew, I knew I was going to end up in in-house with in-house blues. <laughs> there is, as you know, a great crisis in terms of young black men in this Absolutely. country. It seems to be a crisis with no solution. I would disagree that it's a crisis with no solution. Um, I think the kind of uh, program that, that we're putting together at, uh, at Piney Woods is, might be a drop in the bucket, but at least it's a drop. Male faculty members are encouraged to adopt, as they call it, young men without fathers to guide them. Young men the school feels are in danger of dropping out. And there's the male council, a last-ditch effort to stop these boys from becoming the same as the fathers they do not know. We love you. That's why you're here with us. We love you. And we'll beg and plead and whatever is legal, right, and necessary to try to get that, that point across to them that this is a, a good opportunity and don't blow it. Out there in the world, you think that the experience here will have Help shaped me. you and helped you. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I know myself, and I'm sure if I was home, I wouldn't be as, as proud as I am now. I've always been told to walk with your head up, walk straight, be proud, and that, that has helped me a lot. It's something that you don't learn in public school about black people. You don't see, see it in books, definitely. Like, you be not growing up thinking school. your people came over with the pilgrims, and, and that's, <laughs> that's not at all right. <laughs> not <happening. laughs> It's easy for a visitor to this idyllic campus to forget the realities of the lives of so many of these children. The ones who have to steal themselves when it's time to go home. For Monica, life with mother was a trial. I was the mother and she was the daughter. Drugs? Mm hmm Strange men around? No, she would go out and she would, I would be up waiting for her to come in at three in the morning. Were you bad? I was bad. This is my life. Two years ago, Monica Jackson was doing her best to become a statistic. Skipped school, arrested three times, once for attempted murder. The charges were dropped. I got bottles broken over my head, and my best friend got stabbed three times. And after that, I said, this is just not the way I want to live my life at all. I can't handle this. I just don't want to be like this. You wanted out? Big time. I wanted out. She got out big time. For once in my life, I was learning something, not getting by on D's. I was on the honor roll. And that just, I mean, that just surprised me. Monica Jackson on honor roll, you know? And I just felt like I was doing something with myself. I had people behind me to push me. This has really become home, hasn't it? It has. It really has. I say when I graduate from college, I'm going to come back and work a year at Piney Woods and give back to them what they gave to me. And that sounds so fairy taleish, but it's so true. Prom night 1992. It could be suburbia 1952. Old rules and rituals, a reflection of the school's idea of family values and decorum. It may have been a great Saturday night for the kids, but not for Dr. Beatty. He was appalled. He felt some of the dresses made the girls look cheap and tarty. More boys in the hood than Piney Woods. And on Sunday morning, he told them so. We need leadership, young people. And when we, look at, when we look at our senior young ladies, you need to be about the business of setting examples for the...
for the young ones who come after you. You don't know how important that is. And fellas, the same goes for you. The young ones look up to you. Don't let them down. Don't just go along with the crowd. Because you never can tell where the crowd's going to end up. And I never thought I'd feel this way. That feeling by the class of 92 is a mixture of fulfillment and fear and loss of a tough but loving family. I'm really scared to leave Piney Woods because of the things, you know? I mean, I'm not gonna have anybody to wake me up in the morning or anybody to yell at me, really. You know, it's gonna be, it's gonna be me again. It is fearlessness that enables us to put ideas into practice. One must be willing to go against the majority and be content to stand alone. It's a fearlessness for something bigger than you. I always thought about the good things in life. And I wish I can go back to that point where it was only good and never reality happening. When Dr. Jones created this, the students were building literally each building by hand. And all of that was around self-sustainability. The farm was what was sustaining them. Y'all remember like a year back, I was like, I want to go to Piney Woods. And then y'all was like, you better be ready. <laughs> hey, y'all, we in school. I feel like it's going to be a good day for real. I got braids. She got braids. Every day I go through this thing of asking myself, you know, what am I really doing? And sometimes I just get lost in like what's happening. You make one mistake, now you're that mistake for the rest of your life. Let me be the mistake in peace. Many of our young people, they're searching for their place in the world. They want to be seen. I still prioritize education. It's a way of proving people wrong. It's a way of showing myself that I can do better than what I was told that I could do. Like, long suffer. Tell me what it means. <laughs> it means to like stick it out, <laughs> stick it through. Like, <laughs> to long suffer is to like stick with a thing. What would be the legacy of the school if unfortunately we had to close? That's just not an option. <sighs> We're the epitome of resilience and hope and all that good stuff, and you can't take that away. Director J.J. Anderson was no stranger to documentary filmmaking with her productions Feels, Positive Space, and Home Free with Oscar and Grammy-winning musician John Legend under her belt, but still telling the story of Piney Woods School, one of the oldest black boarding schools in American history, was no small feat. While others might have shied away from the weight of that kind of narrative responsibility, J.J. Anderson sought it out. She pursued it with the predominant motivation that this school story was a story that had to be told. And when Disney, ESPN's and Scape got on board to release the documentary in time for Black History Month, one could only describe JJ Anderson's creative journey. And well, JJ, Dr. Crossley, thank you so much for joining Arise Play. It's an honor to have you. I've watched the documentary and I wanna go up the first question to JJ. You've cut your teeth as a filmmaker doing short documentaries. So when the project for the Piney Woods School story came along, how did you know this was a project to make that leap from short to feature length documentary film? So actually this project is something that I developed um, from its initiation, right? So in other words, no one came to me um, for this project. I, I went out and pitched this project and well, alongside Anscape, which is Disney and ESPN's black led media company, um, it came to fruition. They greenlit it and gave us the funding we needed to execute. Um, essentially, 
you know, that's not something I think about, you know, necessarily. I think every filmmaker's dreams is to is to go on and and do scripted features and and you know long form content. But it was less about you know making my mark as a filmmaker and making this a feature as a as, and it was more about just telling the story and, and doing Piney Woods justice. And you can't tell Piney Woods full story in twenty minutes, fifteen minutes, thirty minutes. Heck, you can't even tell it in an hour and forty five minutes. Honestly, this is really just a glimpse into the wonderful work they do. And so it was really out of necessity um that I, I created this project and when it comes to documentary film within the spectrum of entertainment and motion picture documentary film is very unique because mm -hmm. it's almost lauded as the truth tellers of filmmaking Absolutely. so when you're dealing with subject matter like the piney wood school it's an it's a historical school it's a black school how did you make make sure to steer yourself to toe the line so that you didn't become saccharine or over -sentiment, overly sentimental and tell the story that needs to be told and do honor and justice to the narrative. I mean, honestly, that, that was very simple. I think as a documentary filmmaker, all you do is create space for people to tell their stories, right? This is not, obviously this project is something, after I reached out to Dr. Cross, I knew needed to be told, but it's nothing that I've written. I can make outlines, I can ask questions. All of these things are suggestions. You are counting on, and I hate the term subject, so I, I, I use the term on-camera collaborators to really guide you and steer you as to what's important, right? Yeah. And so what might be important to Dr. Crossley might not be important to the kids and vice versa. But um, uh, I definitely wanted to honor the history and that's kind of what we kick off with. But what you're hearing is their perspectives of their, their, their schools. And so for me, it's just about creating space for people to tell their truth. And, and I hope I did that justly. Yeah. Pineywood School currently stands under the watchful guidance of its fifth president and former student, Dr. Will Crossley. One would be forgiven for thinking that returning to his childhood school to run it would be neither a consideration nor a reality for a man who has been presidentially appointed to serve as senior advisor in the Office for Civil Rights at the U.S. Department of Education and has been Chief Counsel for the Democratic National Committee, and has a bachelor's degree from the University of Chicago, a master's degree from Harvard, a Jurious Doctorate from the University of Virginia, and was awarded the Barton Postgraduate Legal Fellowship from Emory University School of Law. But going back to the school that helped mold him as a young man was more than an achievement or an appointment or even an award. It was a calling, and he answered it. For you, Dr. Crossley, um, the Pineywood School is 105 years of history of this school. You're its fifth president, but the first president who's also an alumnus. Why did you feel, as you're in the, stu in the position of stewardship, that participating in this documentary was the right step for the school? Yeah, so um yeah, so this is our 115th year and um you know, we we actually were looking for uh an opportunity to share our story uh with with more people and um JJ came to us um really at just an opportune time uh for us to be able to do that. I think the biggest question that that we faced when she said she was coming and and I knew to do a documentary you know, we couldn't we couldn't control every every piece of it. We've had to be vulnerable, right? We had to be open and allow and allow someone to come in. And so, um, and so it really came down to trusting our team, trusting our students, trusting our staff. Um, that you know what the you know I wasn't there for every um, you know for every every piece of this. So it was really trusting them that. Uh, people would be able to see who Piney Woods was through their stories. And that just picking up on that point, you said about trusting the staff. So I personally went to a British boarding school mm -hmm. and watching the documentary, I did like a compare and contrast for my school, which was all white. The modus operandi is academic excellence and the rounding of character through extracurricular endeavors. It's mm -hmm. the same with Piney Woods, but there's some an extra layer of responsibility on the staff that with teaching all that they teach, there is also the necessity to teach the guidance 
for the existential burden of being black? Do you ever yeah. envisage there could be a piney woods where that burden, that responsibility is not borne by the star? Well, I mean, the, so the reality for this nation, for the United States, is that, you know, the, you know, racism, um, slavery uh, is a kind of birth defect, yes. right, that this nation continues to grapple with every day. Um, but, you know, the message for our young people is how they can achieve in spite of that history, right? The, the story of Piney Woods is one of achieving, right, despite those odds. And so um, that, that's not something you can just assume that young people will, will, will get. And so we're quite intentional about helping our young people build a sense of self-confidence that allows them to go out in the world, you know, unabashedly, unashamed and ready to compete with whoever they encounter. Um, and so I don't I, I think that's part of who Piney Woods is. I don't know how um, uh, there could be a Piney Woods without that story. But just personally, just if we could distill it to just you as an individual and the humanity <laughs> of you, the responsibility of this school is a lot. Why would you choose to go and achieve all the things you have and circle back, come to the school and take the responsibility of I will guide and shepherd the history, the responsibility, the positioning it so it can carry on into the future. Why do that to yourself? Oh, I, I you know, it's it, it, great question. <laughs> the, the thing, the thing, the thing about it, the thing about it is, I, I don't know that I've done it to myself as much as I believe I've been called to the work. Um, Piney Woods, as you'll see in the film, is a is a spiritual place, right? It's called sacred soil. Um, it's it's this space where this this obligation that we have uh, for what we will be in the world, for the impact we will have on the world, is something that's felt very deeply. When the opportunity, yes, I I went to school here and I went out and I did a number of things, and then I had an opportunity to come back to this work. And when that opportunity presented itself, um, you know, there we have a little principle we do here called freedom and responsibility. And of all the things you could do, of all the things you're free to do, what must you do, right? What are you called to do? What is the work that you can uniquely do in the world to impact future generations of young people? And so presented with that opportunity, it was my responsibility to say yes. And I don't know how to do this work every day. I just serve. I just serve as deeply and passionately as I can every young person who's in front of me. And JJ, that point you made about you just create an environment and let, we don't call them subjects, and let <laughs> them be them. Um, I was watching it and I remember the... I, the scene where the students talk about LGBTQ plus matters, there's such a candor that's refreshing to see because being black people, we know that that kind of those kinds of topics are very taboo. So do you put that down to the power of Gen Z or was that the environment you have cultivated where they can be in front of a camera, know they are speaking from the black experience and go for it and be candid and be raw and be honest? I put that down to the power of Piney Woods school kids. You know, I, I can't speak for Gen Z. Um, I think if you if you watch the first uh, classroom sequences, uh, you'll see these models of Socratic discussions that Dr. Crossley and his team um, implement in the classroom, right? Um, and so this is when the kids are given a topic and they're just exchanging at free will their, their personal thoughts. And a lot of those discussions that we have throughout the film are actually modeled after that, right? And so this is a, a way of communication that they are used to. That topic in and of itself was one that um, was consistently coming up. I, I wouldn't have touched on it if it wasn't. It felt important to the kids. Um, the, the particular citing incident that they're talking about uh, was something that was brought up to me, I believe, on the second or third leg of the trip almost immediately. And it was coming from different groups of kids. And so I knew in that moment, obviously, this is something that is sensitive and you're dealing with minors and you have to consider their feelings, not just today, but you know, they're going to evolve and become different people. And so we had very deep discussions about this. And I said, well, if this is something you want to talk about, 
we're going to support you 100%. And if at any point you are in this discussion and you feel uncomfortable, feel free to stop. But I think that their freedom and like you said, their strong candor, that is actually a testament of Pinewood School because this, these are the tools that Dr. Crossley and his team are putting in their hands, right? To, to have yeah. these conversations in such a strong, uh, strong way. Because um, the other thing that I, I just want you to like, again, be personal and from an individual individualistic perspective. Absolutely. As a filmmaker, you're an observer and the lens is just an instrument that you use to observe. When you see that the subject, sorry, the participants, the collaborators. It's just my thing. It doesn't have well, to be I'm yours. A film <laughs> subject is such a fundamental term of film. Magic. I can't escape it. Um, when you see them be, it's almost like you can see the paces of adolescence the yeah. growing pains that come with that. And mm -hmm. you're kind of steering towards the proverbial quarter life crisis that comes with being a human being in this world. When you observe that and you see something where oh, I would tell her this, or I would say that, how do you keep that objectivity to just let it be and hope that they go on to find fruition and become all the things that us in the audience are thinking, oh, I wonder what happened. I wonder what came next. How do you keep your hands off it and not just dive in and become a director? You know, I just have an overwhelming sense of pride and understanding in these kids, you know? And um, I think almost if you interfere with them specifically, what I noticed, if you interfere with their thought process or their feelings, you're kind of ruining a great thing, you know? And so there was never... There could never be a point in which I thought, well, let me jump in and, and let me support here. One, because they have each other, right? These these kids, they live with one another. A lot of them have lived together for three, two years. They know each other in and out, unlike anybody else. And so I had, I had faith that they would have each other's backs in this, and they always did. And so I'm not saying they didn't necessarily need me, but they kind of didn't need me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so like, and that in and of itself to witness that, to witness them pour love into each other when someone is maybe feeling a little uncomfortable or can't quite catch their footing or stumbling on their words. And then like that, that those terms of encouragement, like you see Maurice being very patient in that conversation. Yeah. You hear Chandrell saying, I see what you're saying. You're saying this, you know, they, they have it. They don't need me, honestly, you know? So it was just about standing back and and letting them do their thing and then just giving them a nod and checking in and, and that's it and then of course giving them a big old hug when they're done like they they that's what they do deserve is, is our hugs endless amount of hugs yeah in the unique and often precarious landscape of formal education in a modern world that has ever-changing outlooks on history and legacy the piney wood school plays a role that is arguably more important now than it ever has been in its well over a century of existence. Because for young people contending with a future that is unsure and looks nothing like ever before, for Piney Woods and Dr. Will Crossley, it is a battle that must be waged and won at all cost, particularly for those young hearts and minds that are black in America. So this is a question I was actually going to ask to JJ, but I'm curious to ask it of you, Dr. Crossley. One thing I really enjoyed in the film is something that, from my experience in boarding school going through life, the narrative or this refrain that goes with you through existence as a Black woman of the strong Black woman, we see all the textures of sensitivity and fragility in young girls, which we are forced to then put it away and deal with the world. How do you observe the young ladies at this stage, knowing what they could become eventually and help them preserve that tenderness so they can go on being the totality of what it is to be a woman without letting, again, the burden of the Black experience change them? Yeah, no, so I, I appreciate the question on uh, both a professional level and on a personal level. I'm the father of two girls, okay. right? Um, and so I, I, um, I think about um, when you come to Piney Woods, you instantly realize that we're a big family. 
And, you know, we live on this campus with these young people every day. And so we really do, you know, they become our children and they become siblings to each other. Um, and so we invest in them as we would our own. Uh, and so every morning, you see this at the start of the film, we, we have a talk we do. We have a devotional time together every morning. And I started I started doing that. My wife would, uh, she and I would speak life into our girls before they went off to school in the morning. This is when we lived in Washington, D.C. They were not in an all-Black environment yeah. that was supportive and encouraged, right? But, um, but we thought, you know, these young people deserve the same. Uh, many of our young people, unfortunately, are not coming from environments where people are speaking life and truth um, into them every morning. Um, and so we're just very intentional about helping them appreciate who they are, right? And then helping them begin to, to, to live that out. Um, it's not about another person, right? Uh, it's really about who do we see ourselves to be and who are we becoming? Well, JJ Anderson, Dr. Crossley, thank you so much for talking to Arise. The project is fantastic. And I wish you all the best. And I can't wait to what comes next. I think you should do an episode two and three and four and carry on <laughs> charting these stories. But thank you so much. It's been wonderful. Thank you so thank much. You. Thank you. Thank you so much.